uh, during your medical schools, your careers, you'll read a lot of papers and, you know, most of them will, I mean, you'll, you'll retain the concept, but, um, but a lot of them you won't remember the details. Occasionally you'll run across a, um, an article that you'll read and you'll be like, wow, that was really good. And you'll keep, you know, thinking of that article, referring to that, ar that article. And this is, this is one of mine. If you, if you notice it's from archives of otolaryngology way back in 1992, but, but it's still current to what we're gonna talk about as far as uh, facial trauma. So it's called Extended Access Internal Approaches to the, for the Management of Facial Trauma. And before we start looking at facial trauma, we should look at the facial, uh, the, the skeleton, the bones of the face. Um, the bones of the face are compromised uh, and make up buttresses. So there's horizontal buttresses and there's vertical buttresses. If you look at the, at the yellow in the infraorbital rim, if you look at the orange, which is across the maxilla, if you look at the top brown line of the maxilla, if you look at the green line of the maxilla, those are the horizontal buttresses. And then the vertical buttresses are gonna be across the zygoma and maxilla, which are represented in blue laterally. And then red are gonna, is gonna be the medial buttress, which is essentially from the frontal bone to the maxilla. And then if you look at the, if you look at the picture of the skull on the right, the, the face is essentially divided into three parts. It's divided into the, if you see the red line across the orbits and across the nasal dorsum, that's the superior third. And then the middle third of the face is gonna be between the red line and the yellow line. And then the mandible is essentially gonna be the inferior third of the face. So the question becomes, in the face of trauma, particularly with fractures, how is one going to access those areas and, and keep things as cosmetic as possible and being able to expose the area in order to uh, get a good result with the fracture. So this is um, part of that article that um, internal um, uh, access extended um, uh, extended access internal approaches and the part in red is one uh, and we'll go over that one of the accesses which is the bicoronal the green which is Basically, the orbital area is a transconjunctival approach. The uh, pink part is the sublabial approach. And then the kind of the middle portion of the mandible can be access accessed with the uh, intraoral mandibular approach. So this is the, this is the bicoronal approach. And the bicoronal approach is basically an incision that's made. It starts um, in front of the ear, and then it goes across the scalp, and then comes in front of the other ear. Uh, it's, it's very popular in neurosurgery. Um, and in particular, it's a way to access trauma that occurs to the forehead, particularly because of the uh, frontal sinuses, and probably less frequently accessed to the superior orbital rim, but because the frontal sinuses pass over the supraorbital rim, trauma to that area can uh, lead to a depression there. So uh, with the bicoronal, if you look at the, at the top image, um, on the left of the top image, hopefully you can see my cursor here, uh, if, if somebody doesn't have a history of balding, you could, you could put it more in the hairline, but if there is a history, one would wanna put it farther back to disguise, um, to camouflage the area. And as I mentioned, it comes from the preauricular area over the top. And then what happens is the, the skin is basically pulled back. So, an important thing from an anatomy point of view, the, um, the layers of the scalp, everybody know the layers of the scalp? Anybody wanna shout out what the five layers are? Anyone? Uh, you got skin, cutaneous tissue, um, or connective tissue, sorry. Um, 
Uh, you have aponeurosis, loose areolar tissue, and the periosteum. Correct. So scalp is a, can be an, is a mnemonic for the layers of the scalp. Um, and, and what happens is with the incision, you go through the skin and you go to the um, L, which is the loose uh, connective tissue just above the periosteum. And after you make that incision, you follow the periosteum down and just above uh, the um, eyebrow area on the frontal bone, then you incise the periosteum and you can bring that down forward now and get to the supraorbital rim. Now the important thing laterally is that there's a nerve that comes across that if you follow that plane subperiosteally and go laterally, you're gonna cut that nerve. Anybody know what that is? So it's, it's the, frontal nerve, the frontal branch of the facial nerve. So what you have to do instead as you come laterally is there is uh, the temporalis muscle and you have the superficial layer of the uh, temporalis fascia. So the incision has to go through that and then you raise that up along with your periosteum in order to preserve the frontal branch of the facial nerve within the flap. And that can then be carried down to the supraorbital rim, the lateral part of the zygoma, and even the zygomatic arch for exposure. And there's a way, there's a supraorbital nerve that comes uh, at the superior part of the orbit. You could free that up to get even a little bit more exposure and come down even to the uh, nasal dorsum. So um, anybody care to describe what this is showing. So a little bit of advice, when you have uh, an x-ray, you wanna say like what the x-ray is. So you don't wanna just say there's a defect, you know, blah of the head. Uh, you wanna say what kind of x-ray it is and then describe what the, what the findings are. So anybody care to read this x-ray? I can try. Sure. So this is a CT reconstruction um, with a depressed skull fracture involved in the frontal sinuses and the left um, superior orbital rim. Correct. So this is this is the defect, uh, blunt trauma involving you know as you say superorbital rim and uh, the basically pushing in the frontal sinus. So in this case, a bicoronal flap would be very good to disguise the incision necessary to repair this, as opposed to just making an incision right across it. So there's a concept in all of medicine uh, called open reduction internal fixation. And what that means, open reduction internal fixation, is that you expose the bone, then you reduce the bone, and then you fix it. And we'll go over ways to, ways to fix that. Uh, there are some, some ways like a zygomatic arch, you can manipulate it uh, with a closed reduction, um, but open reduction internal fixation or ORIF is when you actually expose the bone, reduce it, and then do something to stabilize it. So this is again with the, with the bicoronal. Uh, these are Rene or Rene clips that are put on to minimize blood loss. Uh, again, you carry it down, you incise the periosteum, then bring the periosteum down to expose the bone. And again, you can see the anterior and posterior tables of the frontal sinus. That's most commonly where this is utilized. And then this is brought down by freeing up the supraorbital foramen in order to keep that in the flap. And then another, another view uh, here, the bicoronal or hemicoronal, these are Rene clips or Rene clips in order to uh, minimize blood loss. Neurosurgery uses this all the time uh, for a uh, frontal craniotomy. Um, but again, 
you don't incise the periosteum until you come down here uh, to, and then you have to, you have to um, incise the superficial layer of temporalis fascia and bring that down in order to preserve the uh, frontal nerve, frontal branch. Uh, so moving on to the approaches, uh, can anybody tell me what this person's problem is? So I would, I would start in, in the center, so looking straight. I mean, the eyes are a little off, but not too, too much. Particularly when this person looks up, what you'll notice is that the left eye moves up, the right eye does not. When you look here, looking down, so downward gaze, the left eye moves down, the right eye doesn't. And then you have various degrees of restriction on lateral gaze. So this is a classic um, orbital blowout fracture uh, with restriction of upward gaze. So a person's gonna see double, uh, not necessarily looking straight on, but in particular with an orbital blowout fracture with looking up. So orbital blowout fractures occur because the um, globe, uh, sorry, the orbit has a limited volume. And if an impact such as a fist or a ball um, increases the pressure within the orbit, the weakest point in general is going to be the floor of the orbit. And it's not so much that it's not the globe that gets caught in the fracture. It's not always even the muscle, the inferior rectus uh, or inferior oblique that gets caught. It's very often the periorbita that gets caught and, and leads to the restriction. So this um, this, I'll do it like I would ask you to do it. This is a uh, coronal CT um, of the mid face at the level of the orbits. And if you look at the normal side, here's the maxillary sinus. If you look at the floor of the, uh, of the orbit, it's intact. This is where the infraorbital nerve is gonna be. These are the muscles, the medial rectus, lateral rectus, inferior, superior rectus. This is gonna be the optic nerve. Um, and, but if you look at this side, of course, there's two blue arrows to it, but, you know, comparing the two sides, you can clearly see that there is a fracture of the orbital floor. And again, it's not so much that, that the muscle is stuck in there, but there's going to be um, periorbital fat that can lead to the uh, restriction. So anybody want to tell me how many how many bones comprise the orbit? So if you, if you think of it systematically instead of like just throwing out names, uh, there's seven bones that comprise the orbit. So this is a this is the right side. So going around, you have the frontal bone, you have the zygoma, you have the maxilla. Uh, more posteriorly, you have the sphenoid. Then you have the palatine bone, uh, and then you have the um, uh, what am I, oh the lacrimal bone. And did I get them all? Let's see. I think I got them all. Yeah. So there's seven seven bones that comprise the orbit, and then you have the super, uh, superior and inferior orbital fissure, and then the optic nerve. But the fracture. It's going to be here. Commonly, people with an orbital blowout fracture will also have numbness of the cheek because the infraorbital nerve uh, can be disrupted from the orbital floor. So what does one do for that? Um, in order to determine if it's indeed entrapped or if it's due to swelling, uh, there's a test called the force duction test. And with the force duction test, what you do is you put uh, topical anesthesia on it. Because I work with pediatrics, frankly, I've, I've never done this awake, but I always do it before um, a repair of the orbital floor. And basically, you grab the limbus of the eye, 
And with that, you attempt to move the eye up, attempt to move the eye down and see how restricted it is. And it's important to compare it to the non-involved side. And it's something I would do before a repair of the orbital floor fracture and something I would do at the end of the procedure to make sure that the restriction is no longer present. So in order to get there, cosmetically, uh, there's an approach called the transconjunctival approach. And instead of making the incision inferior to the eyelashes where there's gonna be alignments left, the incision is actually made inside the eyelid. So if you look here, the eyelid is brought down and the incision is actually within the eyelid. Um, and in order to facilitate that, you free up the eyelid. There's a thing called a canthotomy, which is where you cut across the lateral canthus, and then a, a canthal lysis, where you cut, a, cut across inferiorly in order to free up the eyelid. And by doing that, you can expose the infraorbital rim and then expose the orbital floor in order to free up the entrapment. So this is, um, this is a real picture, but here's a drawing. And again, the incision is made inside the eyelid and the conjunctiva. And then um, you follow the orbital septum down to the periosteum of the orbital rim, incise that, and then go into the orbit in order to uh, free, up the, free up the entrapped area. So anybody care to tell me what this one is? What the problem is here? So, so as we've seen before, uh, 3D reconstruction is, is really quite remarkable because, and it's only gonna get better, but um, so this is a 3D reconstruction of uh, left mid face, and this is the disruption of the zygoma, um, and it also involves the orbital floor. And so it's a zygoma fracture, it's also called a tripod fracture, so if we look at a skull, the problem with the name of tripod fracture is it's a misnomer because the zygoma actually has four attachments. You have the zygomatical frontal attachment, zygomatical maxillary, um, then you have the zygomatical temporal. So that's three, but you have a fourth, you have the zygomatical sphenoid. So it's actually four attachments, even though it's referred to as a tripod fracture. So in order to expose this area, part of it can be exposed through a bicoronal incision, but the other way is a sublabial incision. So the incision with that is made um, just above the gingiva, and you go through the periosteum, you go through the soft tissue, the muscle, go through the periosteum, and then free up the periosteum off the bone. Uh, the concern is the infraorbital nerve, so you want to preserve that in the foramen, although it's often fractured across there. And then by exposing the bone, uh, you can reduce it and stabilize it. So ORIF, internal reduction, uh, open reduction internal fixation. So the exposure you get allows you to get to even up to the infraorbital rim. And to fix it, there's, there's basically two types of plates. There's metal plates that are often made of titanium coming in uh, different configurations depending on where you need them. Uh, I like absorbable plates, uh, particularly working with kids. You know, I, I'm not confident that these are gonna hang around for like 70 years. Um, so I like the absorbable plates as opposed to the uh, metal plates in kids. And in general, when you plate a fracture, you wanna get two holes securely on one side of the fracture and two holes with screws securely on the other side of the fracture. And, you know, as you can imagine, you may or may not have seen these, but you actually, there's a drill into the bone and then followed up by the appropriate size screw. And again, depending on where, depending on where you need a plate and depending on 
what configuration you need, that's what determines what you go for. And again, here's the infraorbital nerve right below the, um, right before the, or right inferior to the orbital rim. And not only are there plates for the mid face, there's also mandibular plates. So that brings us to some more, uh, so like a frontal sinus fracture, sometimes you want an X or a, or a rectangle. Uh, and then there's also plates that can be used to stabilize the orbital floor after reducing a fracture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, very little about Lefort fractures. Lefort fractures are, uh, there's three types, one, two, and three. A Lefort one fracture is going to be across the maxilla, basically through the, through the uh, maxillary sinuses. And all these, what all these fractures have in common is that there's a disruption of the pterygoid plates, which kind of makes the definition of a Lefort fracture. Um, so again, a Lefort one is gonna be horizontally across the maxilla. A Lefort two is gonna be across the nasal dorsum. It's gonna be across the infraorbital rim and then separating the zygoma from the maxilla. And then the third of the fourth three is going to be across the nasal dorsum, goes across the medial and lateral orbit, basically separating the entire mid face from the rest of the skull and mandible. So to fix these, you have to determine what your alignment's going to be. And if the jaw is intact, there's a, there's a uh, process called MMF or uh, mandibulo maxillary fixation where you fix the upper teeth which are unstable to the lower teeth which if the mandible is not broken are, is stable and then you continue up in order to um, use those points of fixation to stabilize the rest of the uh, facial skeleton. Or you could start from down if the vault is stable to plate from the top down. Here's a mandible fracture, which can be uh, a mandible fracture here. This is a, a Panorex x-ray. Here's the mandible fracture. And that can be exposed by the fourth incision that's part of that paper, which is basically um, just below the gingiva and then bringing the incising the periosteum and bringing that down. And this is the uh, mental nerve, which you want to preserve if possible, the although the fracture often goes through that to preserve the sensation to the chin. So this is the most common uh, fracture. This is a nasal fracture. And with the nasal bones, you know, sometimes people will be like, well, why don't you just push it over? The problem is, is that the bones, when they break, can often overlap one another so that you just can't push it back. So you have to reduce the bone and then bring it over. This is called a Boise elevator. It's very similar to uh, a butter knife and that goes uh, in the nostril and in this case I would bring the right side up and lateralize it and then bring the uh, left side up and medialize it in order to straighten out the nasal dorsum. And in, in, in my hands, this would be something for sure I would do under an anesthetic. I know some people do it under local anesthesia, but I've, I've literally hit, seen people hit the ceiling trying to do it under uh, local anesthesia. So we're going to shift gears quickly to soft tissue trauma. Uh, oftentimes when you first see a laceration, this is a dog bite to a left ear. Uh, it may appear that there's tissue loss, but if you look closely, like a jigsaw puzzle, if you look here, this uh, peak will go into this valley. And even though this part looks to be missing, uh, the soft tissue is actually there. And again, here, this laceration, uh, these parts do fit together. And, you know, after repair, it's all there. This is just a scab here. But again, sewing it together, uh, most often all the tissues there. Now there are times where 
I'll get called for laceration and I'll be like, I have no idea. So if it's just this with the cartilage gone, it's a very, very difficult repair. In this kid, they actually brought in the piece of the ear. And frankly, because I didn't know what else to do as far as fixing that up right away, I decided to plunk that piece back on, which for all intents and purposes should not have worked, but for some reason it worked out well in this, in this kid. Anybody tell me what's wrong with this, this kid? So this kid, um, this is the after. He was bitten by a dog and he had all this soft tissue completely gone. And, you know, I looked at this and, and frankly, I thought, I have no idea how to fix this. You know, there's a thing called a forehead flap that you can rotate in, but that's cosmetically, uh, especially for a nine-year-old kid, can be pretty morbid. So there was a there was a rep that talked to me just before this about a product called Acel, and it's urinary bladder matrix. So just because I didn't have anything else to do, I decided to put there's a powder, and what it does is it facilitates ingrowth of skin. So I put a powder on. I put this sheet of uh, uh, urinary bladder matrix on the nose. And uh, lo and behold, after several months, he regrew the skin of his nose. Since then, I've, I've used it uh, four or five now. Other times, this is a child who had the skin of his ear bitten off, and after putting a cell on, regrew the skin. This child had part of his forehead taken off. I put the a cell on, same thing, healed up well. And then a uh, uh, fourth example, a little bit of a scar, but much better than trying to close this primarily. And the thing that I'm most intrigued about is that this child who had the medial part of his eyebrow taken off, he grew, he's growing hair in that area, which I don't quite understand because this area was totally gone. But um, it's something to consider, it, you know, if bringing tissue in becomes difficult. So as far as um, suturing, what you wanna do with all these lacerations, you have to close them in layers. So if this, which it did, goes down to the bone, you have to sew up the muscle, you have to sew up the subcutaneous tissue, and you have to sew up the skin in order to diminish the tension on, on the areas. And, you know, kids heal up very well. So this is how she turned out afterwards. She has this slight defect there because I had to rotate mucosa in because that oral commissure was actually bitten off. But she's done, she's done very well. So in the interest of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because I know we have two other presenters, but I just wanted to talk to you a little introduction about facial trauma and fractures and how they're repaired and soft tissue repair. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can ask them now or I'll hang out at the end. So if the other presenters want to get going, uh, I'll be around to talk some more at the end.